the number of rural foundations that do looking at technology implementation, especially in rural areas. One is called CORI, the Center of Rural Innovation out of Vermont. And they just published a report that really talked about the lack of technology opportunities in rural areas. And we'll make that report available on Newbrick's website, newbrick.org. But today I thought it would be really helpful to get some of our key leaders from industry here to talk about, A, the work environment. And to echo what Blade said earlier, a lot of people have the idea that manufacturing is like Lucy taking chocolates off the conveyor line and shoving them in her mouth. It's not like that at all. It's an elegant industry. And I think what we have to do is somehow reframe that all the way down to the student level, because it isn't the three Ds, dark, dirty, and dangerous anymore. So um, if you would, start at the end. Would you introduce yourself, please? I'm Bill Swan. I'm the division manager for Associated Milk Producers here in Guam. I manage the butter <coughs> manufacturing plant on Center Street. Blade Montgomery, uh, Senior Vice President of Partnerships with Project Leadway. Jim Nicasio, I'm the 3M Director here for New Home. I've been here since October last year. Uh, Talon Wald, I'm the President of Spexus, so I run Spexus in town here along with uh, seven other locations across the Midwest. Uh, Darren Dugler, uh, I'm the Plant Manager at Kraft Uh Mike Flecker, uh, you've heard I do STEM at St. Paul's from New Orleans Middle School. Nathan Nolte, I teach uh, Engineering Project Lead the Way in, and Computer Science in Fox Valley Lutheran High School at, in Appleton. And I'm Paul Wessel, the CEO and President of Newbrick. So I'll kind of ask as, act as facilitator here, not trying to draw out too many questions, but I've had a lot of discussion with Ian, so I'm going to start with you, Ian. Not only because you have a three on local perspective, but you've been in Canada, you've been in South America. Give us your comments on what you think, how, how do you perceive this? Is this the right direction? Is it the wrong direction? First of all, thank you for being here. I think this is so important for New Orleans to have this discussion because what we're facing here is no different than what we're facing in Canada. Um, I had the opportunity to build an N95 plant there, and in the end, trying to find engineers was as challenging as being here, and very similar in South America as well. And I think I shared with uh, Paul yesterday that right now I have eight engineering jobs that we need to fulfill that we're not finding applicants from New Orleans, that we have to draw that from the cities or from Mayfield and other areas. We have at least 55 production uh, jobs that we need to fill right now that we can't find people. And we need another 100 on top of that by this time next year. And what I appreciate what we're doing here is to exactly break that mentality that manufacturing is dirty, dark, because uh, it isn't, right? We have some uh, interns are doing programming for cobots, especially in our water filtration line that has nine robots that know exactly what the next phase robot is doing or is supposed to do. <coughs> that is all what I saw here today. So pretty excited to see that. That's why we're partnering with Newbrick as well, right? Not only from a funding perspective, we're going to provide robots and make sure that our engineers <laughs> connect to that. So if we can start to plant the seeds early on, so our community understands that they do not need to move to uh, Silicon Valley to work with Google or Tesla because we have that technology here, right? And I know that we have that pretty much with every industry that's sitting here today as well. Interesting. So how many people know of Spexus in New Orleans? All right. How many of you know that Spexus is working on artificial intelligence? <laughs> Talon, will you tell us a little bit about what Spexus does and where you see the future of manufacturing and how education and manufacturing might converge a little closer? Yeah, so Spexus is a contract engineering and manufacturing organization. So what that means is I build stuff for other people. So I build equipment for Caterpillar, John Deere, Case New Holland, you, you name it. If it's got an engine in it and it's made of metal, I build it. So a couple examples of projects right now, we're doing building 100 excavators for a company out of China. We're building 24 locomotives uh, for a couple different maintenance <laughs> companies across the United States. Um, 
see a lot of ready mix trucks, the concrete trucks out of the New Alton facility specifically, that's what they're primarily focused on. And so that's kind of a high level of, of what we're doing on that side of thing. We also have, offer engineering and some electronic repairs and some other kind of cursory things um, along with that as well. Um, I'm echoing what he's saying as well. We're, um, we're 50 people short today, and we're 150 people short next year. We're at very similar numbers to what he's looking at as well. My plus side is I do have a net kind of spread across multi-different um, rural locations. Um, and the reason that we had to go in that direction is because we couldn't find people where we at. We had locations in Granite Falls, Minnesota, and then we joined New Ulm, uh, bought this facility 10 years ago, actually this month. Um, wasn't enough people, so we've had to add facilities instead of being able to get people locally, which we would have preferred. Um, for anyone that's ever done any fixed cost analysis, it would be a whole lot better to jam more through one plant than have four plants and, and all that different stuff. Um, but we're constantly trying to pair with um, our local education areas as well as um, all the towns that we're in to try and figure out how are we filling this funnel of employees coming in down the road, um, but not just the standard employees that we have now. We are definitely, everyone is being forced to push in the direction of more automation and all that goes with that, which is opening up some new jobs out there that might be a little bit more attractive to people that are coming out now that are currently sitting playing video games so down the road are going to want to look at a computer instead of look behind a weld machine and, and that kind of stuff. So we're, we're spending a lot of energy trying to figure out how do we get more people engaged in those kind of areas because there's no choice but to go in the direction of automation right now. It's a new day compared to 100 years ago when everyone looked at automation, they were terrified saying, oh, it's gonna, we're going to get rid of all the employees. No, there's just not enough employees and we need more, so this is the only way that we're going to be able to grow. One of the use cases that I personally worked on was in Detroit, where that mindset actually came to the forefront with United Auto Workers when robots were first announced. And there was a Swedish company called ABB, Asea Brown Bavaria, and they did a very smart thing. They built a mock assembly line on their own nickel. Of course, they outfitted them with ABB robots. And they invited the UAW to come in and put hands on and work with them. And what they found over time was that the UAW concluded that it could improve their quality of work and that the robot was a enabling tool for them to produce a better product, therefore assuring them that they had you know, a, a longer time to work in the automotive industry rather than this robot just go and, and, and replace them. But I see that and I just like to hear from Bill Swan and Darren, you know, from a corporate side, when you don't have people, what's the thought process from the corporation down? I mean, you're almost forcing the hand to automate if you can't get people, correct? Uh, maybe. So, uh, you know, we're a farm co-op, so our job is to take in our members' milk, process our members' milk. If we can't process our members' milk, for instance, at our Jim Falls plant, they went from a seven-day operation to a five-day. Got it. And so, so for us, that meant uh, moving milk through our whole system further west, more miles, more dollars of transportation, five dollars seventy-five cents diesel fuel is just killing us. Yeah. Um, so not necessarily the, you know, one of the alternatives is just to pull back your business. Which and, isn't good for anybody. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, someone mentioned fixed costs here earlier. Yeah, you got you got to put as many pounds to the facility as you possibly can, because it's the only way to keep up with the increase in utilities and health insurance and all those things you gotta you gotta deal with, and uh, and so making them less makes things real difficult in a hurry. You start calling your customers up and say, hey, we gotta raise prices, you know, and and, and we told you tell them last month, and then three months down the road you go well. We got to raise them again. Pallets, you know, wood pallets. You see all this stuff stacked on. But we used to get those for seven fifty each. Now they're twenty four bucks. Wow. You know, and yeah, we should maybe put in a pallet manufacturer here in town. <laughs> Fully automated one. <laughs> but uh, we'll have the kids geez. work on that. <laughs> right. Yeah. So they're so, we'll build, we'll get, we'll build. so I mean, our plant is highly automated already, and, and we're probably putting near four or five million dollars into it right now to try to make it do more. Right. But um, you know, to to the UAW point, it doesn't really get rid of any people. 
you know, the people have to be there to tend and mine the machines. The machines are great at doing the same thing over and over and over and over again the same way. They're horrible at dealing with variability. And you've got to have people there to deal with the variability that comes up every day. Darren? Yeah, I mean, we're fortunate. We're pretty automated. So right. since 2015, we've invested a lot of money in the, in the dual facility. Uh, always looking to automate additional, right? So just like these guys have said, you know, we're probably 40 people short um, today. Um, but we need people that can go fix that equipment, right? We need people who can, you know, repair the automation that we have in place, uh, as well as work on the line, right? So we're similar to, to what Bill was saying at API. We're, we're pretty automated. We, we don't have a lot of hands-on, but, you know, we need folks to, to go in and, and keep the lines up up and running. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I will say, as I look at this program, you know, within the leadership staff out at Kraft, there's there's eight of us. Four of us have either engineering or technical backgrounds, right? So we've all started in those technical fields and then branched out into different you know jobs within that factory. So lots of opportunities, right? They're always looking for you know kind of that engineering-minded person as, as you know within our company. So within craft, I, I think you know they're looking to automate as well. Our facility is, is pretty automated, so others are probably getting that funding. So we get in a, we're in a tough spot, right? We can't automate the jobs we'd like to um, because other other plants are taking that funding, right? So there's a limited amount. They're kind of going to the biggest need first, and, and so we're kind of at the bottom of that list. So we're in, you know we just got to figure it out. So, so listen to this, between Ian, Talon, and Darren, in the next year, that's well over 200 job openings for New Orleans. Now, I'm not here to tell, tell you that Project Lead the Way is a silver bullet because we also know that we have a housing crisis and we have a daycare crisis. And as Talon was saying, it's really the three-legged <laughs> stool, right? You have to have good workers, but you have to have housing, affordable housing, and you have to have child care. And so we're not alone, but the point that I'm trying to drive home is if we do nothing, <laughs> that's exactly what we'll get. We've got to do something. And I think that it bodes positively for the wall if we can then produce these types of students that are job ready via the PTLW, PLTW curriculum that then that gives Darren, that gives Ian, and, and not so much talent, but when you're talking up to corporate, they have an argument for New Alms saying, do you know what New Alms doing and in investing in their students? They're coming out with these sets of disciplines and it's a good place to bet your money because this is a product that's coming into the workforce. Well, if I could. Please, if, Ian. If we do nothing, we'll lose business. And that becomes a bad style. Absolutely. Right? Uh, today we have conversations when an opportunity comes, uh, similar to what I think everybody is understanding the geopolitical situation in Europe and some parts of Asia being shut down because of COVID again, right? right. The corporation is looking back into the United States and saying, where could we move this business into? Right. And it goes down to how fast can you hire people? Show me what the past three months, five months has been higher engineers rate, um, production workers rate, uh, and how engaged you are in the community. And we're comparing plants between us here all the way down to California to see where the business should go, right? right? So if we start to be really behind on that trend, we're gonna start to lose business here. And then the fixed cost, that's the death spiral that I talked about, right? right? And then it becomes more and more expensive for what we do here, and then we lose business, not only new business coming in, we lose business that we have, right? right? And I don't think we can afford that from a community perspective. No, yeah, and before you two got here, I, in my remarks earlier, I said, I picked on 3M, but I said, let's look at 3M, and this is all publicly available information, so the 3M plants pay probably one and a half million dollars in property taxes a year to New Orleans. That's revenue to New Orleans. Now let's say 600 of those employees in 3M work in New Orleans and live in New Orleans and pay an average of $2,000 in property taxes a year. That's 1.2 million. To your point about a death spiral, if you start losing that business, it will have a halo effect, and then that affects the New Orleans economy, that affects how much money we can use, 
to keep up the city of New Ulm and reinvest in New Ulm and make it a viable living place, nobody wins. And we are almost tapping out, right? I was sharing with Tim that we have investment all the way to the end of next year, but the five-year plan, the corporation is looking at us and saying, how about we see what happens if you can actually get the people, the talent, the development that you need by the end of next year, and then we talk again, right? Yeah. And then that's where we start to lose some of that business to other, especially states that are providing some subsidies and taxes as well, that plays a big role um, into that. And I second the point about housing, because I was staying in a hotel in Mankato for <laughs> the first three months right. when I moved from Canada here, right? Because you couldn't find a place to buy, right? So it's, we have to start doing something, and this is pretty exciting to see that uh, the, the strategy today, that's why I came earlier from the panel as well, just to understand where we're starting this. We're getting kids engaged on that. And that's why I mentioned, let's open the plants. Let's get these kids walking around in a safe uh, process to understand they can do programming for robots, either for pallets, for uh, cheese, butter, uh, whatever business that they're into, to show them that that's cool, right? And we can definitely bring the engineers or the interns that we have at the plant, as I shared with some of you, that wearing their vans and their hoodies to say, hey, there's a cool place to work here, instead of listening from, from us, where I say, oh, they're, they're not cool. But we have all that going on. We have wow. all that going on. Wow, do I feel old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're still cool. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. They didn't meet me. Yeah. Paul, I, I think this is, this is so, all so interrelated. And I think one of the slides that Jason had up earlier is, you know, the business, the higher ed, the, the pre-K through 12, it, it, it all has to interrelate. And I, I think a couple points that, that I want to make. You know, first and foremost, I think what you just said, Ian, is opening up your plants, bringing the kids, letting them see what's available, see what types of jobs are there. Um, and, you know, and talking to them, particularly when you get to high school kids, talking about what starting salaries are and, and benefits and those kind of things, because I, I don't think they understand what's available. And, but the second part of that is, is letting them know, and Darren, I think you mentioned, that's not, th this is not, this is a starting point for you. It's not an ending point. You can, you can continue to progress. You can continue to go to school. You can continue to, to, to get more education and more degrees or, or whatever. It can lead to other things, but this is a starting point for you. So I think that's really important. The second point that I wanted to make is, you know, when I was a superintendent in LaPorte, Indiana, I sat on the Economic Development Board. And, and when you talk about new business wanting to come to your community, one of the first things they ask about is what is your school system like? If they're gonna move a business and they're gonna bring employees here, they wanna know what the schools are like, what are your schools offer? And I think this, you know, could potentially be a big selling point for this is what our kids are learning. This is how we're preparing them for the future. So I, I think it's all interrelated. And um, you know, I, I think the plan that you've got, and in, in, it's fantastic to have business people here because uh, so often education and business, that there's this disconnect. You know, I, Paul, I made a comment to you earlier today. People talk about a, a skills gap. Uh, I'm not so sure that it's a skills gap. I think it's a, it's a connection gap. And that's what we have to try to do, is to make that connection uh, with schools and students and, and business. So. And I think from a community standpoint, we could do a much better job in messaging that manufacturing jobs are cool. I, I, I think about the ads you see on TV for the Army and the Navy and the Air Force. It's not guys doing push-ups in the jungle, right? <laughs> it's guys flying the M14s and the, and the F-35s and, and the cutting edge stuff, drone aircrafts and different things like that. So we can do that, but that's on us to make that, to change that messaging so that our kids say, you know what, this is really a cool place. So um, what else? How do we handle, and I know this is getting off of our, our lane a little bit, but housing. Um, last <laughs> night at our, our Mixer event, we talked about the Project Spark Bus, which was a commuter service that could go get employees uh, out on the western edge and even in Mankato. Uh, are you seeing in other plants, Ian, them being forced to look at kind of out-of-the-box solutions and getting workers to the plant? Not yet, um, but I'm fully engaged on that, and as we've talked about, 
Um, I'm just hoping that that construction is over and we can uh, really engage in that discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how long that's going to take. But yeah, Tim's got a lot more problems on the MBL than anybody else. <laughs> How's that working, Tim? <laughs> just talk to Jeff for trying too about the Eaton Wall Public School District bus routes and so on through there and have the also. Okay. Yeah, but we have to be creative, right? And that's why we're. Um, definitely engaged on options to be able to bring resources from whatever we need to uh, into the world. And I like your point about it's not lack of resources, it's lack of connection because we do have 12, 13,000 people around the world. How do we make sure that we engage them on the right um, aspects of the science so they find that here and they stay here? Right. Right? Lovely community, everybody very welcoming. The Minnesota nice is true, right? Yeah. So I experienced that many times already uh, being here. So how do we change, how do we make that science cool? How do we engage that? I don't think we're all good in advertising like the Army is, but <laughs> how do we make that in school? And I was so impressed Mike, when you were sharing your, your slides into, okay, so this is what we built here. Let's see how we do that on the cheese factory, how we do that on uh, any factory that we have in town to say, yes, this is applicable to the day to day. That might change the fact that they just want to work in a video game, right? And become a video game ninja, if that's a still thing that they have there, right? Right. And that's what my kids tell me. No, you're <laughs> old. <if> you're <laughs> <that too. laughs> and I think that's the perspective that we have to do, not only between the school system and the industry, but also with the kids and what's out there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right? Exactly. What are the options that they have to stay in town? Yeah, you missed the saying earlier, Ian, but I we have a saying that the kids can't be what they can't see. Right. If they don't understand what's out there, it's, it's hard for them to visualize the future. Mm -hmm. And I think we're some, somehow already engaged with some schools in some sort. Uh, some of them have connections with VM that we bring those resources to the site. But how do we do that as an industry and the school board in a more organized way mm -hmm. instead of a one-offs? Right in there. Chase? So, Paul, I think there's something that you've got here already. You've got a video crew here you know, we can't always get the students into the cheese factory or 3M or whatever, but you have the tools right now to start getting resources together from their companies, whatever industry is out there, and just packaging it in a way that is age level appropriate or even you know somewhere in that middle. But it's a good place to start that you don't necessarily need a program to have that. But having those resources already helps Mike bake it into his class if he said, okay, well, let's see what's going on at the cheese factory. What do you see going on with this palette? What are the, like, having him start deconstructing some right. of that programming structure that you see and he was talking about earlier. Like, it's all there. It's just, you don't have to have the tours. Those are cool events to have, but there's so much simpler stuff we can start with that we can do now. Right, and that's where I see Newbrick's role too, <coughs> kind of being that glue that tries to bring all of these things together. And then on an educational end, I see Project Lead the Way as kind of a glue that everybody now has a common vernacular that we can talk about so that when we come into plants, regardless of the school that we send our kids to, they'll have a product where they've been trained on. And, and I think that that is nothing but positive. Yeah, Mike, I think you mentioned that earlier when you were talking about your kids. You took them somewhere and they saw, they're like, oh, we recognize, we've done that before. So, I mean, it just brings the connection and the relevance to what you're teaching in, in class to show them that, yes, this is what's actually applicable. Out well, and, and even when we've done the sort of manufacturing tour, that's dad down there. That's mom over there. They, they've never gone and seen them at work. They, that doesn't happen. It's not allowed, whatever. Okay, we're going to get in there. And then the parents come up and talk. And what, what, what are you doing today? And here's what we're doing. And, and now you know, can watch me go work with that machine again. And especially with uh, the normal precision tool getting in there. And, you know, the kids are standing right right by him as a guy's coding a machine, closes the door, has this hunk of metal in there, and it, the laser cuts it. And you were saying, you know, I don't know, I think you were saying, great, you use them for some things or no? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so we have businesses in town that use other businesses in town. And the kids, some of the kids have never been in there. It's, it's applicable to that. So they're like, yeah, yeah, okay, so he's coding that. And it's like a 3D printer with a laser, yeah. You know, so they have that concept down already. They're beginning to see that at the middle school level. And then when we do that, and we only go every other year with that Minnesota manufacturing tour, but it gives them an opportunity to see it. And then, you know, we were talking earlier when they asked, well, how much do you make? 
And when the guys tell them, they go, huh? And they look at me and I'm like, yeah. You can stay in New Orleans and make, make way more than I'm making right now as a teacher. And they all laugh and they go, you should work here. I'm like, no, no. I like doing, I like, the, you know, do what you like, but still. But again, you're right, to make that connection with the industry, with the, with the school system. And, and I kind of mentioned that earlier, maybe not with one-offs, but is there an overarching or you know, maybe through New Break, is there a program where, where we rotate through at different levels or, or different people come and talk to kids? Just, again, I think someone mentioned earlier that's the wall, you know, so, you know, you don't know what's happening. We know AMPI makes butter. Okay, we get it. What else? I don't know, you know. The trucks drop off the milk. It's a co We get it. But do we really get it? You know, do, do we really understand what's happening? And then when you begin, especially at middle school level, and then with the high school courses, if, if we adopt Project Lead the Way here in town and, and we go that route, it, it gives them a chance to, to see. And then I like the, the vision of possibly, like with Biomed and others, you, you can partner with industry. You know, so the seniors in high school, maybe they're getting some work release time or school or credit time, they're popping into the factory or they're meeting or they're talking or having conversations. So not that that's going to be your choice, but that's maybe not happening as much. It does happen, I'm sure, but maybe to target it mm -hmm. or to have something like that where you do have that partnership that says, here's what we've got. Again, I think many people aren't aware of, all, of how technical manufacturing has gotten over here. Well, and the work-based learning, I think, is a, is a long-term vision that you can have to start to build that workforce pipeline. Um, you know, we've seen you know several of our partners that are, are doing that. Lockheed Martin was the probably doing it better than any anyone in their facilities. You know, they, they start kids as, as interns their senior year in high school. I mean, it's, it's a rigorous process. They have to, it's at the point now where it's very competitive. They may want to have 200 kids that want to go there and work, but they, they last year they took 54 at the, the Dallas-Fort Worth plant. And they, they start those kids their senior year in high school working part-time there, but then if they do go away to college, they bring them back in the summer and continue that internship and, and ultimately end up hiring. And so, and again, I know there are <clears throat> oftentimes age restrictions and, and those kind of things, but, but my point is if Lockheed Martin, uh, an aerospace facility, can find a way to do it, then, then let's, 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 let's work to yes. Yeah, let's find it. Should. Yes. Bill, if you, had, if you had a couple of things to tell education and economic development, how can we help? You know, from the education standpoint, um, you need people that are comfortable with computers. I don't need them to be, I don't need them to be programmers. Uh, you know, I just need them to know, hey, we've got, this is a program we're gonna use. I need you to be comfortable going in there and just learn that. We'll teach them that, that part. Um, you know, from an economic standpoint, I sympathize with you trying to find a house in New Orleans. I came here 22 years ago, and that was the exact same scenario that, that, that I went. I only got a house because the CEO of our company happened to know someone that was going to rent out a house that, that somebody had, and I got the inside scoop to go live there for, for, for six months. Um, we have... Uh, Hopefully I get this number right, but there's something like 6,000 people drive to New Orleans for jobs. I had uh, some reports done by the University of Minnesota Extension Service. On a daily basis, there are 358 people that drive from Mankato to New Orleans and 338 people that drive from New Orleans to Mankato <laughs> every day. Yeah. That's just Mankato, though. yeah. That's just Mankato. That's everybody else, though. Yeah, yeah that's just Mankato. The, I was in the Highway 14 project, some of the planning for oh, that. Oh, sure. And, and uh, Google supplies the, the state with all kinds of wonderful numbers sure. as they monitor our phones. Yeah, but, but uh, <laughs> you know, they talk about all of the traffic that comes into New Orleans with the people that work here. You know, what would, you know, if you could just get half of them to be here in town, right. you know, where the population would, would go from 13.5 you know, which it's been for, I guess, 40. 50 years, or, yeah, something like that. You know, to go to, to 16.5, right? And it's more kids for the schools, that, you know, that translates into more dollars. Of, you know, the, this whole death spiral, you know, it can be an up spiral, but right now you can't do the up spiral because you can't get anybody here, right? You know, our apartments, we have built some really nice size apartment buildings, and they're all full, right? You know, 
you know, uh, we've got 1.4 people per home, last I heard, in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 1.4. That's great. You know, so, so we keep building all these housing, but all we do is we keep, we keep the looting out to how many are in each one. Um, you know, so the, the land acquisition for the city, uh, for their part, uh, helping developers, uh, even with apartment buildings, they don't all have to be single family houses that are $300,000 a crack. Right. You know, there's, we gotta have a place for those folks to live. That, that's, you know, that's how you build that community. Mm -hmm. And right now the community, my opinion, community is thinning. And, and uh, as we're getting older, we were, uh, we were one of the oldest per capita towns our size in the whole state, mm -hmm. age-wise. You know, you know, I'd see see Duwam become, you know, become one of the local churches where, you know, you're 60 years old and you're the young one. Right. You know. Well, the juxtaposition of that is, too, because I've done a lot of work in elder care technology and things like that, is there are a lot of aging people in Walm that still live in their homes. Yeah. But that's the most effective, cost-effective yeah. place for them to age. Yeah. Yeah, you know, skilled nursing and assisted living is really expensive. I, I think last I heard, there was about 28% of our town's population was over age 70. So there's going to be a churn at some time, but is that churn going to catch up with the demand that we need for workforce? I don't, I don't think so. Same question to you, Ian. Education, what do you think of this? How can we mobilize it? And then what can the city of New Orleans do to, to help? Well, I think everybody in the room here knows that science is what Tibetan does, right? They actually change their uh, low analysis of just innovation to science applied to life. <coughs> and we're here to help, right? If, any school system here is with the idea to say, we need to do the lab, we need to bring this science. Let us know, I was just talking to, to Tim, say, you create products for all the uh, products that you're doing, let me know, we can provide you all the wire connections, all the duct tape, oh, yeah. we can do all that, and we can bring some of our engineers as well. So we're here to help, like, what do you need? Let us know, let's break that wall, let's leverage new brick, because the first time the call went to 3M, I had to sign a check, so let's, <laughs> let's continue to build that relationship and leverage new brick and uh, what we're doing here. Contact us, right? We're just a few steps away. Like, how can we help? Like, you have pretty much all the big employers in town right here, except for the city of New Orleans. Let us know what we can do to help. Talon? Yeah, so the, the relationship between the, the education system and the business in town, I think that some of the just little things that can be done. And he, he kind of touched on a little bit as well when he was talking over there a couple minutes ago as well. Projects that tie in local businesses, whether it's just the fact that our name is involved in a lesson plan or an end project happens to do with something that that craft is trying to do. And, and if you guys are looking for little th little hooks on, on activities that we're doing or projects that we have, whatever, to, to just have our names in the school system so that they can continue to remember hey, there's jobs in the small community, because a lot of what we see, there are a percentage of people that come out of high school and they immediately go into the workforce right away. Um, the long-term employees typically are gonna be the ones that disappear for a little bit, and then they remember, hey, there's jobs back in my hometown, that's right. where I wanna raise a family and do all that kind of stuff. If they don't know that the local companies exist and the types of positions that happen to be in those places, um, it's gonna be tough. And so that's the biggest thing, just, Forcing the awareness, in my mind, is that biggest thing. As far as the question on the EDA, I think we're coming quite a long ways. I think we had, in the New Ulm area, some challenging years, to say the least, for the, the current companies. They did a great job of recruiting companies, um, but let's focus on those that are here. But I believe we're turning the corner there. And so I'm just excited to see where we actually go with that, because I, I don't need to get into my past year frustrations there. There you go. <laughs> Darren? Um, well, so I, I will say, I, I think it's great what, what a lot of the schools are doing today with a lot of the classes that they're offering, right? The CTE Center at the public school, I think MDL has something similar. So the kids are coming out of school with some background. So those kids that do decide to enter the workforce, um, for us, that, that's a good thing, right? They have some really practical classes that help them integrate well into, into our workforce. Um, and, and I think that's key, right? How do we get into the schools? How do we talk to the kids and 
let them understand that there are a lot of opportunities. Um, you know, what we see out at Kraft now is, uh, you know, jobs that used to take 20 years seniority to get, you know, people are getting six months, right? Just we need people that are, are comfortable around computers, they're willing to do the work, um, and, and it's not a bad place to work and lots of opportunity for growth. So I, I, I like to see that, I, I'm, you know, this is, you know, I'm hopeful that this can happen and we can continue to produce more, you know, students coming out of school with that background, and, and as long as we're keeping our name, you know, in front of them, that they know they have a place to either come back to or go to right after school, that's great. Um, you know, and, and yeah, I think, you know, cer certainly housing um, is, a, is a big big deal for New All. You know, I think we just did a, a little quick poll. I think we have about 450 people, and about half live in New All, right? So the other half we're pulling in from surrounding communities. And, and when I say live in New All, they have a New All address, right? So that, that could mean some of the smaller communities around, but uh, the other half are coming from beyond that. So, right. um, and, and that's definitely a shift from where we were 10 years ago, right? 10 years ago, it was probably 75% New All. So. Yeah. Interesting. Indicative of this problem, all these gentlemen who are running plants for our major employers in New All came here today because it is an issue. And it's an issue that not one group can solve alone. And so I would like to thank Darren and Talon and Ian and Bill just for coming and sharing their knowledge with us and helping us understand. So thank you. Very much. <laughs> Any other questions or comments for the for the group? A short answer. Um, <laughs> for the most part, what we're able to hire regularly for, for myself, it's it's entry level, but we have postings and would love to have more experienced people coming in as well. Um, it's that's been less of the norm recently. We're we're pretty much training everybody from scratch and getting them into the more advanced positions as we go, but um, it's the it's the full range. And Glade spoke to Lockheed Market. I'm looking at it, that that's what's happening is they're leaving to get an education and they're not coming back. What are the other creative things that we have you explored to get that to happen? So at 3M we, we have a way to try to lock people in, is that if we can't find the resource with education coming in, we're paying and supporting them to go after <coughs> that and then they sign a contract. We'll pay for you, but then you have to stay employed with us for a certain period of time. That's, one, expensive. Two, is an extra burden for folks that they have to come to work and go to school at night, right? So there's a challenge there as well. Um, so it's not the perfect solution, but it's somewhat where we're trying to find uh, ways to get to that next level of education requirement from within the organization, right? Um, and those usually stay longer. Right? Once they find the, the company's investing in me, so I should stay. So the contract is just uh, an add on. I didn't need the contract for the life of the year. But again, if we pay for education for 50 people every time because that's not available in the community, it becomes very expensive for the organization. We'll, we have to actually uh, lower our education requirements in order to get folks. So we will take people that do not even have a high school education. And uh, if they'll interview fairly well, we'll take them from there. Uh, uh, we are big on promoting from within at API, and most of my staff has is, is, uh, all worked their way up through the ranks in the plant in various, in various positions. Uh, we also offer, hey, if you want, uh, Gail to know, you know if she should get a finance or an accounting degree. And my answer was yes, <laughs> you know, and, and we'll pay for it. You know, you do have to pull the double duty, uh, you know, week at work at home and, and other things to, to do that. But, um, you know, so we, we really do have the full gamut of folks. And if I had folks that were, you know, had college degrees already in fields that I wanted, be glad to bring them on.
yeah, we're, I mean, we're mostly entry level, um, you know, so high school, degree, or diploma, or, or equivalent. And we do a ton of training, right? Just like these guys have all, all talked about. So we'll train you to what you need to know, and then that's really endless. And we do you know, a lot of promoting from within as well. So, you know, it's really just getting them in the door that seems to be the hardest thing. Dave? We talked about getting the kids to see behind those cement walls, so to speak, but would, if that happens in this curriculum or otherwise, it would no doubt be a good thing, but wouldn't the logical next step be just as college recruiters come in, you know, to talk to juniors or seniors as part of this curriculum, couldn't it be major employers from the community come in and talk to juniors and seniors about the positions that are there, about what type of education, if you want a position like this, they should go after, or what they could do just because of this curriculum from the high school without an education, to get the quote unquote clause into these students in a very intentional way, because otherwise, without that step, this is preparing kids to go off without that hook to bring them back. And, and that's what I'm scared about, and I think that would be a lot of your concern, that if you're supporting this, great. <clears throat> you're helping out other plants like you around the country, potentially. Well, this is where that, some of that disconnect comes that he was talking, because every one of us would go to a school this afternoon and talk about what we have to offer, and we're all, we would all sign up for it immediately. Again, we're sitting here for a reason. Yeah. Um, and we've tried to, we forced our way into a couple of schools and different examples. You know, I've been into New Axe on a couple of different occasions. Um, we've had people go and help with the Willow program at the public schools as well in New Ulm here. Um, we would do that way more. Um, it just, the, there's that miscommunication or, or disconnect inside of there. Because I know that we would all do it. We would all send people that have expertise in areas that would help out with that. Um, it just comes down to that communication piece. Hey Bill, there's a, a stopgap measure though that you can use and that's the teachers that are here now and other teachers that you can use to help share the um, opportunities that are out there. They also have the best voice to the parents who are 60% of the convincing for a lot of these positions is trying to get a parent to understand that the opportunity <laughs> with any one of these companies, even though you're just getting your foot in the door, it could be a lucrative one in two years, three years, five years. And that's, that's half the battle, if not more, than the battle, but the teachers are a resource that usually stays in the school where you guys can't always get in and you have, like you said, the disconnect because you're showing up in your suits and your embroidered shirts and the kids are like, yeah, okay. But if the teacher reinforces it slowly, incepts them a little bit, then that's a lot more reinforcement over the years. Now we're converse next time. Yes, <laughs> that helps. But, and you know, talking about getting into, into the facilities to see them, you know, I, I think we're probably all open to something like that as well. Um, you know, with COVID, one of the things we ended up having to do just from a corporate standpoint, because we didn't have any travel, was we did virtual tours, right? So um, really easy ways to, you know, highlight some different areas. And, and obviously they can be customized to, to fit that. It's just what's the right venue within the school to show them, right? Because out of all the student base, not everybody wants to see it, right? They all, some have plans, you know. So, so it's like how do we target that right group of people where it's worthwhile to spend that time? Blade, do you see Project Lead the Way as that common denominator in communication? Because what I'm hearing is when you guys go into the school and talk about like Spexes, that there might not be that connection point from the student to really get their head around what Spexis does. But if we can start implementing Project Lead the Way, to your example, Mike, when they went down to Southern Minnesota Tooling or whatever it was down there, oh, hey, I designed something like that. Or there's a CAD, there's a CAD drawing. And so I think we can build up common points of reference that both industry and education can then refer to. Yeah, and I think a big uh, part of what we want to try to start re-emphasizing to our schools, particularly new schools, is the value of what we re used to refer to as a partnership team. So the schools would actually get, you, you know, you would have your PLCW teacher, you would try to get a counselor to make them understand what is available, what's going on in a PLCW classroom. You get an administrator, but then you get local business 
and industry. You may even get some parents and a couple students. And it, it's really about bringing all of these things together from that PLTW classroom perspective. Um, so I think I, I think there is possibility in that, and that can kind of be the uh, the common focal point of of what we're trying to get done. And what I heard from Jason is that HR is also an important component to bring into that communication as well. So just for an example, Ian has a five to one ratio on his technical employees to his degree employees. If you look at what you said earlier about engineers to your workforce, a lot of the students don't know that getting into an apprenticeship or an internship early on is a good way to get your foot in the door. And I'll tell you a little secret too about the Toyota AMT program we were talking about earlier. They do a really good job of advertising the full progression. So they'll get, I think they've had 11 or 12 valedictorians from schools around their sites. And that's, these are kids that are graduating number one in their class, signing up for the AMT program to go be an AMT technician. Because they have the hook at the end of it that there's a four year, there's a possibility, possibility to get a four year degree through this AMT program. And it could be a business, it could be a management, it could be one of those things. But there's just that possibility there for those students to actually end up with a four-year degree if they do this program. The real secret is, and Toyota has the data on this, of the pre-interview for the like 80 or 90% of the kids who say, yeah, I chose this program because I'm gonna get my four-year degree, like 3% actually follow through to get their four-year degree because they love the work so much on the manufacturing floor because that represents what they saw in the Project Lead the Way classrooms. That's the hands-on, project-based, team learning, problem solving, every day is different, it's exciting piece that they really liked and that's the piece that got them in the door in the first place. So even if you have, like Ian was talking about earlier, they're talking about the possibility of paying for somebody's education. As teachers, if we can say, look, well, you know, here's, here's this opportunity, you can still get your four year degree, call it a working scholarship or whatever you wanna do because you're gonna get in the door as an intern or an apprentice, you're starting at this opening position They'll teach you, they'll work with a community college or a technical college somewhere, or even just the skills that you may need to know on the floor. And through whatever pathway, if, if those kids like to get into it, once you get their foot in the door, like Bill was saying, or Tim was saying earlier, you usually have them. And that's, they find out that they really like the work they're in. And as, as long as it, it you know, they, turns out to be lucrative or not, or they can have a living wage, they're usually really happy where they're at. And, even though that carrot is still out here, maybe in five years when they have a family or they got a kid and they think, you know, oh, okay, maybe I need to start going this route, they still have that option. But it's getting them in the door, that's the real tricky part. And it, it works when you can just say, here's that progression. And I think it's honestly more for the parents than for the students sometimes. Nathan, I'd be, be interested to hear what, you know, in, in Fox Valley, a different community, but, but how, how you're incorporating business and industry into what you do there. Uh, and there's quite a quite a variety of of high tech manufacturing and other uh, opportunities in the valley. Um, also, several different opportunities for for higher ed and technical ed. So um, we get students going in a lot of different directions and exploring a lot of different opportunities. Um, uh, we've got different amounts of collaboration. There's there's a couple groups that we're a part of. There's a, a Northeast Wisconsin. Um, uh, manufacturing group and an IT group that has some uh, community collaboration with industry leaders um, to, to, to build those bridges between education uh, and industry. Um, there are more things I'd like to do uh, at our place to, to tie that in. Um, I think what it also does, and looking over the, the more than 10 years that we've been doing it, um, is you know having just that STEM program, it, it does, bring that conversation just into the school community and the broader community. And you know, the, the, the kids coming to the schools are of their parents are the kids that are working in those industries. And, and, and without that at the education level, that, that might not be a part of their everyday conversation about you know, what they're doing in their jobs and what opportunities are there. Um, and as those opportunities um, are more available and transparent and, and obvious to, to children in the schools and it becomes something that they're the, that they're looking for in schools and and the kids are doing things that relate to what the parents are doing in their jobs and it, and it opens up those conversations and 
some of the outside of the classroom experiences too, like the, the robotics competitions and some things like that. that uh, we bring in a lot of um, like uh, engineers and, and, and technical people from businesses to participate as like judges at our robotics competitions so that they can, they have that background, but then they can have those conversations and they can see what's happening um, in the schools with the kids too, and they, and they get excited about that as well. So, so I think adding in just that project lead the way or whatever STEM program it might be, it can open up those conversations in the community and, and it can make it more just a talking point and something that's in the, and more in the consciousness of everyone. Mm -hmm. And Paul, I, I don't think you can ignore, and nope. Jason alluded to this earlier, I don't think you can ignore the importance that each of you play as educators in this as well. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly the socioeconomic status of everyone in New Orleans, but the, the districts where I worked in public education were both high poverty districts. And let's face it, every child doesn't go home to two well-educated parents that are talking to them about the things that they should be thinking about in the future. So the more that you can help make them aware, that I mean, we've all seen this and read this, that probably one of the most influential people in a child's life is a, is a teacher. And for you to be able to make them aware and help them understand what's available. And that's where that partnership comes in. It's not just these gentlemen and their teams going into the schools. It's also you letting them know and you learning about what's available and trying to help those kids understand that too. It's, it, that's just really important. That's why there's just, it, it, it has to be integrated. It has to be a team effort. And, and I think you're so fortunate here in New Home because you have Newbury and Paul leading this chart and getting groups like this together. I, I mean, in other communities, they're trying to do this just in, in silos, one off. So I think your vision for what you want this to be is, is so powerful. Thank you. I think to build on that, um, kind of my takeaway from today was um, children do what they see. And in my classroom, we bring in the firefighters, and we have doctors, and we have a, you guys, we need to bring you in to make you the cool dudes. Right. Um, so I like that idea. Come on in and, you know, bring those robots. I mean, pique their interest, because I also learned today that if we don't do that by second grade, I was surprised by that. So bring them in. I teach the younger ones. And to pique their interest, I mean, they're building, they're creating, they're making structures. Hey, when you build that structure, this is what I do at my job. You know, so get them even younger, so please come into my classroom. I can make you the cool dudes. I mean, <laughs> these are cool dudes. Firefighters are cool. You know, I had an army person come in. I, when I grow up, I'm just like him. You know, that kind of excitement, if you're going to pique their interest, early on, coming in my classroom, I think that would be that great Give us a call, we'll be here. And I'll extend that the other way around as well. So, uh, to be honest, 36 years in New Orleans, uh, this, this fall, we actually opened the doors of the plant for the employees and their families. Um, I know my HR will freak out this afternoon, but I'll extend the invite. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we'll get to her. Yeah, and, uh, I'll extend the invite to the school board um, to come and do a tour in our site as well, so we can actually see the robots that we have. So, because. I don't understand everything that goes in the curriculum that you teach today. But if you see what we do, you may say, hmm, I should bring that engineer for that department because they do something here that's a lab, that I can bring that lab scientist to come to the school and work with everything that we saw here today. Come and see what we have to do. So I'll make sure I'll make the right connections to have that email out. So for those that want to attend on that Saturday, that we're going to open the doors of the plant, and come walk, see, talk to our engineers, to our leadership team, so we can really open this partnership through this, to Newbrick, to everybody that's here. Because I think somebody said something very important. I think we're employing half a family. We are concerned about this. So let's do this together, right? Let's make sure that we're there. Hey, you know, just to back that up, you know, uh, pre-COVID, I was bringing my robotics class in the 3M and uh, having that personalized tour turned a number of them into going into that field. So, so arranging for stuff like that is so very valuable. Let's do it again. Well, I think 
thanks to the panel. The oh, we got one more. Okay. Can I, can I also make one suggestion, just because we had some industry back in my home area that did this when I was in high school, to maybe um, make some job shadowing experiences available to high school students, because that way it would give them a taste of what really happens in the day in the life of an accountant or an HR person or you know something. The jobs that they that the kids don't hear about. You know, That's a good point. So those job shadowing experiences before they choose their program of study helps plant the seed that, well, wait a second, I never thought about that particular job before. You know, that, that Spexis currently to. does that. So we had a gal from the high school this, this last year that did HR, we've had accounting, we've had finance, we've had engineering, we've had a couple of weld students that have shadowed on the shop floor, we've had people in the paint area. Um, so we've done quite a bit of that as well. And, and we've actually had um, about half of them come into employment with us later on. We have one last topic after I excuse the panel, and that is talking about adoption barriers. And then nothing gets done unless there are action items. And I think one of the action items I'd like to see out of this is a working group that's represented across the schools where we can keep moving this initiative forward. So why don't we take a, a, a bathroom break and thank again our guests from coming in. We appreciate it very much. Guys.